starting from the beginning about the Thrive Project and why we've developed the Thrive Framework and Platform, transitioning people from being part of the problem to becoming actually part of the solution in terms of the issues that we face uh, in this world. So some of the imagery you see here is indication of some of the actual existential threats that we face in the world. Uh, we see here uh, biodiversity loss, we see habitat loss, we see uh, people living in, in poverty, in squalor, uh, lots of waste, uh, whether you talk about plastics in the ocean or whether you talk about uh, landfill, um, people oppressed, uh, people uh, suffering enormous injustice um, and uh, you know, droughts, floods, uh, obviously climate actions, you know, two emissions related to that and so forth. There's plenty of bad pictures uh, that can be shared in regards to this. And we all connect with some of these uh, at some point in our life as to the um, uh, level of uh, impacts that we're having, negative impacts that we're having on this world. So I'll bring you to another image, a much more peaceful image, a much, a much more uh, inviting image uh, in terms of solidarity, in terms of harmony, in terms of prosperity. So here we see uh, actions in that regard, whether it be about maintaining uh, our land and our oceans in a such a satisfactory sort of way, uh, looking at uh, how we use uh, energy, how we use uh, transportation, uh, and looking at uh, ways to ensure that we have uh, uh, clean air, we have uh, nutritious uh, food, access to, to crops, that are nutritious for us, and uh, we're not uh, causing the sort of harm as exemplified in the earlier picture. So essentially Thrive is about making this transition. Uh, we are a key uh, organization in this space internationally around the world. In fact, we often called in to partake in uh, sharing our knowledge and expertise in this area. And in fact, just as recent as a couple of nights ago, we were invited uh, to speak at a major event that took place. Uh, and I can tell you around the table, we had uh, uh, United Nations, we had uh, World, uh, World Benchmarking Alliance, we had representatives from uh, Europe, uh, North America, uh, also from uh, the Global South. We had a number of representatives from there, and very uh, well-known um, people who are instrumental uh, making this sort of transition, making this change. I say people, in some cases, organizations. So we are actually part of this. We are one of uh, a handful that was about maybe 25 people involved. Uh, some people were involved with COP26 uh, recently as well, um, 27. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are part of that group. So that's just to set the scene a little bit. So why do we do what we do? Well, our mission is to deliver providence and prosperity by illuminating the way forward towards integrating thrivability within the fabric of society and the env uh, environmental ecosystem of the planet. So we understand that as a world, we're not sustainable and we need to become sustainable. And even going beyond that, we need to become thrivable. So more than just break even, which is what sustainability essentially is about, we're more about going that one step further and make sure we have a thrivable uh, future and integrating that as part of the fabric of society. So it's not an afterthought. It's not something you just add in maybe sometimes afterwards. It is fundamental to the way the, that we actually operate as a, uh, as a society. So that's our mission in helping that to achieve that. So our vision is a world where all life forms coexist in harmony and solidarity with each other in the pursuit of global shared value creation and prosperity. So how do we do what we do? Well, we have a research arm uh, where we have a, a collection of experts in global sustainability research, uh, and we believe in the science to plot the way towards the best path towards the future. We also have an education arm, so we look at providing extensive information, resources, on current uh, thrivability matters. Uh, and I emphasize thrivability matters. That's actually a handle that we use throughout our social media and our websites and so forth. 
Um, and we're looking to do this through a number of different ways. Certainly webinars and presentations uh, with guest speakers is one way, podcasts is another. We also have blogs uh, that we produce on a weekly basis and a variety of other things such as workshop, conferences, uh, presentations. And as I mentioned, uh, also brought in as a consultant, uh, like I said the other night we did in terms of sharing our know-how in this space. And the third arm is advocacy. So we speak to the community on sustainability issues and encourage action, uh, as well as ongoing collaboration with like-minded organizations. So it's not about just uh, uh, talking the talk, it's about walking the walk. So we're looking at actually making the changes. And we certainly see cases where we change legislation in some countries, uh, we've introduced um, new systems and methods, which ultimately saves lives has actually made the world better for certain people in certain parts of the world. We're part of a collaborative. Uh, we don't profess to have all the solutions or to be the only organization that can do what needs to be done, but we're certainly an instrumental key organization in this space, collaborating with a handful of others uh, in the specific space that we work in, but part of a larger group of around about two and a half thousand organizations in this regard. And uh, I could cite this as an example of something that uh, has been said about uh, the Thrive Framework, which I'll go into in more detail shortly, which is our unique offering uh, to this space. So we're looking at uh, systemic holistic solutions, ones that can be uh, replicated, ones that become, as I said earlier, part of the fabric of how society operates. So the Thrive Framework has actually been spotlighted, and I quote this, as a key data platform for further disseminating implementation of the indicators. Now, this is a statement that I'll just put some context around, was uh, as a result of a UN uh, risk uh, report, which is uh, one particular arm of the United Nations. Uh, in that report, they were looking at thresholds of transformation. So looking what is actually the uh, safe operating space that we have for humanity and, and all animal life and other life forms here on this planet and how to ensure that we appropriately uh, provide thresholds and allocations uh, for this. And uh, as I said, the Thrive Framework was spotlighted as a key data platform for disseminating and implementing the actual indicators that came from this particular study. There's a link to the study on our website about this. So the systemic holistic model is a, a key element uh, and, and really an overview of uh, the approach. It uh, consists of four key quadrants. One has uh, related to measuring the significance of what's been done. Uh, another looking at the scale at uh, which things are happening uh, and then the scope. And largely, and lastly, sorry, the, the shift. So if you go around uh, clockwise, so from top left, uh, you'll go significant scale, scope, and the shift. And the shift is basically encapsulate what is necessary for us to achieve what we need. And as you see in each of those quadrants, uh, there's a list of what we call factors uh, that are key to this sort of transformation. So how do we develop uh, a roadmap ahead of us to allow thrivable transformations? Those same 12 uh, headings that are included in those four uh, quadrants are repeated here with a couple of key uh, references. Uh, again, the presentations and even the journal articles relating to all of this are all linked on our website. If you go to our documents page, our presentations page, you will find these particular sources. So for those who want to read further, please do, do look up uh, this information but there's some sort of key references provided here. But just to highlight a few different ones that are relevant, obviously we don't have time to go into this tonight. Um, one of the things we need to consider is what's called materiality. That's in the bottom right-hand sort of area. Uh, materiality is what is important to us, what's material to us to, to look at. Is it important to know, for example, uh, if someone's in the mining industry, how many deaths they had last year from mining? How relevant that is? Well, for some people, they would argue very relevant. Okay, how relevant is, for example, the uh, education or training that's provided by, say, a government or an institution? That's something. What impact that, does that have on uh, the sustainability uh, 
of um, of us here on this planet. Uh, you look at complex, wicked problems in the middle there. Uh, we understand there's tension between the different resolutions. What may be good for one may be bad for another. What may be good for this group may be bad for this other. So we need to actually combine uh, the comp you know, understand the complexity of the world that we live in. Look at all these factors, talking about, for example, um, carbon sinks in the ocean, looking at climate change, looking at biodiversity loss, looking at the nitrogen cycle, looking at all these various things that come together. And there's tension, I said, between them, they are very much interconnected and understanding how to deal with what this complexity, and we call them compl complex wicked problems because uh, there's probably no no exact win-win solution. There is some level of compromise all the way to actually get to, to a solution that to a large extent keeps uh, the best sort of outcome overall. Uh, top uh, corner there, we have linear to circular economy. This is probably the area that most people relate to. You know, recycling, reusing, re-engineering, uh, uh, yeah, refurbishing, et cetera, all the rewords. These are things that we can do to be more effective about how we use uh, resources. Uh, but I would stress that linear to circular economy does not um, mean just circular economy principles. We should also be looking at uh, circular economy by design. In other words, looking at how these processes and how these say products come about that we use, whether they actually need it at all. Maybe there are better ways to re-engineer things. Again, not enough time to go into it tonight. Uh, integrated reporting, and we have, I see Denise here, who's uh, looking at um, integrated reporting for us as an organization. So this is looking at uh, not just the usual financial reporting that everyone's familiar with, but looking at also from a societal point of view and from an environmental point of view, what effects do an organization or a government or an institution actually has and looking at these in an integrated way. So they're not just afterthoughts. Uh, finite resources just directly below that. Uh, most of us would accept that we live in a, in, a, in a world with finite resources. So we can't use the usual consumerism model that uh, has been embedded in us over the last couple of hundred years where we just make, use and dispose. Uh, we need to actually look at uh, more like biomimicry, uh, like the natural world or works where there's a continual sort of loop that uh, that things go through and there is no waste and, and there is no shortage of what's uh, required. Uh, how do we value things? Value base in the middle there, top, that's another thing. Uh, and top left there in the purple corner, we have uh, transdisciplinary and the concept of systems thinking. So looking at the system as a whole, when we actually evaluate it, um, uh, you know, what's happening. Happening. So not just from a particular stakeholder's point of view. Um, there's many more there, context-based, very important, looking measuring our actions in relation to availability of resources, so looking at uh, numerator divided by denominator, uh, and so forth. So just briefly covering on a few there, obviously not enough time to actually go into them in any great detail. I would encourage you to read uh, further in the in the articles that are on our website and also linked to the site. Now, before we actually investigated um, what became the Thrive uh, framework, we actually did a review of uh, current approaches out there. So there's actually a study that's been uh, written where we evaluated the top 22 approaches, uh, some of which you may be familiar, uh, obviously SDGs, uh, how they work their system, uh, SASB, uh, looking at GRI reporting, looking at corporate nights, uh, and there's a multitude of different uh, systems and approaches uh, that exist out there uh, with various levels of um, of quality, I guess, in the process and, and perspectives. So again, not enough time to go into it, but you can see the Thrive platform listed at the bottom there, and it's shown to have uh, include many of the things that are necessary and needed or necessary and sufficient, as we would say, to achieve uh, the system. But one thing to bear in mind about the approach uh, that we've developed is it's a uh, design thinking uh, or design science approach. So it doesn't reinvent anything, but actually brings together in a 
collaborative way, in an integrated way, what we actually know uh, is true and from a scientific point of view and what we need to do from a methods point of view. Sometimes I get asked who uses Thrive, and I guess uh, just looking to be brief here, uh, analysts use it, researchers use it, governments, uh, media, uh, as well as ordering consumers and business. And uh, there's a bit of a breakdown there. It's almost half of the use cases are actually consumers. So people want to know, when I go into that store and I buy something, am I actually aiding organizations that are doing better or am I aiding um uh, uh you know making the world a worse place than it is now a little bit more on this a little later uh this is about the scale linking so a lot of talk is around companies performance and and how organizations are performing there's a little bit being done at the bioregional level in terms of studies out there and uh, actually active uh projects in place looking at at a regional sort of uh, level and we do have the united nations who tend to look uh, tends to work at a country sort of wide level but really what we need is is something that's scale link uh so that we take stuff from fundamental creatures uh all uh, animal life uh let's say on this planet and going all the way up a group of creatures uh like humans become say a company uh and i use company in a general sense could be uh a uh, you know, cooperative, an institution, uh, a firm, a business, what have you not. Uh, going to the community level, which is one level above that, sort of looking at regions and so forth, city level, country, continent, cosmos. And indeed, the way it's set up, it could actually work uh, in other places, meaning not just for planet Earth, but as we will probably see in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, uh, this is very much applicable on other places such as Mars and also the moon where there will be a need to actually address this. Obviously beyond the scope of tonight, but just thinking about it much more than just at an individual person level. Threat platform version two, which is the instantiation, as we would say in technical terms, is a case study, the example of how you would use the technology and the understanding that comes out of the Thrive framework is our example. So Thrive Pla Platform version two is on our website. You can certainly go in and have a look. It is a demonstration. It's not meant to have all the data. It's only meant to showcase how this sort of principles and application of it. And um, you see there an example, some of the charts and graphs that goes with it. Sign up if you haven't already and go in and have a look at that. Some people wonder why we use this particular symbol. It's actually from our Chambella chart. So these are the charts that actually our system produces, our Thrive platform, which is to explain the impact that we're having. So if we think of this colored area as a normal area in which we operate safely, so this is like above the inner limits and below the outer limits, so a, a social floor, for example, a minimum uh, level of uh, quality of life, for example, or minimum wage or any of those sort of things. And then you've got the outer limit, which is, a uh, environmental ceiling so we don't want to produce too much pollution or too much waste etc and so forth so this is what we call a safe operating space which is in this colored round cylindrical area and then the impacts we have in is actually made by this sometimes people call it scatter chart that sort of sits on top but as a whole this is called a chambella chart and the size of these slices is what we call allocation and in the middle there, you see the performance index. So we can actually measure in very specific quantitative terms uh, the impacts that we're having. There's a version of this as an app as well, which you might have seen as this, which talks about their formula, weights and engines and date times, et cetera. Again, beyond the scope of tonight, there are plenty of presentations in our presentation area of our website, which goes into much, much more details as a full on video explaining how the system works as well. So I'd encourage everyone to go and have a look at some point. Um, and so far as uh, defining strategy, uh, this is uh, more of interest people involved with say sustainable business models or sustainable models in the general sense, whether they are referring to businesses or to governments. So for example, uh, governance uh, structures and so forth, uh, we adopt uh, a fair amount of machine learning and. Uh, other advanced sort of cloud computing, predictive analytics sort of technologies uh, in actually establishing uh, these particular strategies. Uh, again, more information available online for those who are interested. 
and kind of beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. I'll just continue with an example of, of a industry that we did an evaluation for, and that's the seafood industry. Again, details about this are available online, but I'll try to briefly give you a, an idea of what we discovered. Now, firstly, people ask, why did you look at the seafood industry uh, or even the ocean governance sector as a whole? We have a whole cluster in Thrive that works on ocean governance. So if you have an interest in this, uh, please join that particular team. And ocean governance covers, yes, plastics in the ocean, biodiversity loss, carbon sinks, uh, even things like uh, abuse um, in the seafood industry. There's a lot of abuse of workers, things like that. Um, and uh, bycatch and lots of other things that are not terribly good for society, things that are happening. Uh, but one of the reasons we looked at uh, the seafood industry is because uh, in ocean in general is because a third of the world actually is affected by this industry. Either you live in a city by the ocean, or you may even be a person who um, eats uh, seafood or fish. Uh, and certainly a lot of places that is the case. So if you think of Pacific Islanders, um, you know, maybe a family, husband and wife and two kids, uh, a family of four, the husband goes out every day fishing to bring home a few fish. That's how he feeds his family. So this is a essential part of how uh, many communities around the world live. Uh, so don't just think of the typical thing where you go into a store and buy a can of tuna on the shelf. Uh, for us in the West, that's all we need to do. But for some people in this world, it's you know what's they call subsistence uh, uh, fishing. It, it's required. This is the only way they can survive. And there's certainly enough fish in the ocean for that. What there isn't is enough fish in the ocean for all of us. So that's the thing. Um, so when we looked at the seafood industry, we evaluated all what we call keystone actors. These are the top players. Uh, and there's about 300 brands represented. You might recognize some of them here. This is not all of them, of course, but just to give you an idea. And in the study, if you look at the uh, Thrive platform, you actually can see this data represented. So I'm just giving an idea here. I won't go into it details, but you can see a lot of companies, uh, the top 30 companies as such that we've looked at. Um, we got their performance index, SPI, Sustainability Performance Index. Uh, we looked at how they, they ranked overall. And um, as part of it, sorry, it's a bit slow, uh, we actually determined a score. So the actual top score is 2.698. That's out of five for this particular group, uh, so barely above average. But that's the, the top player in the industry and so far as being sustainable. So looking at their supply chain, look at how they, they run their work practices, all those type of things. Uh, you can see what we call here on the left uh, classification of things. So we've got governance and accountability, public reporting sustain on sustainability, disclosure of stakeholder engage implementation, et cetera, et cetera, training, traceability. Yeah. The list goes on and on. There's about 60 data points in this particular slide. Obviously, I couldn't show everything. But you can see the allocations, the inner and outer limits that apply, the impact that they have in, and then the, the sustainability performance index for that particular uh, topic. And then overall, uh, based on the weighting that's given to each one of these, which they're formulations for this, um, that come about, again, beyond the scope of what we're going to do tonight, sorry, uh, then you come up with an overall score, which is that 2.6898, uh, and that's the top scorer, which is actually a little company, um, not so little, uh, called Thai Union, and you're probably thinking with a name like Thai Union, they're based in Thailand, and they, Thailand, and they are, um, but they are actually uh, one of the largest uh, and they have particular labels that you might recognize. Um, so let me show you. So coming back to here, who is Thai Union? People say, never heard of it, wouldn't know who they are, et cetera. But here are some labels that they represent, and they come up as the more sustainable organization, still far from 100%, but the more sustainable one. So if you see these little icons jumping up and down on the screen, it gives you, or moving around, 
gives you an idea. These are actually the brands represented by this particular organization, the Thai Union. Okay, not all of them have the word or seafood or fish in them, as one would gather. And this one down here at the bottom that you just saw, probably most of you recognize that brand. And it's actually owned by a Thai Union organization. So it just gives you an idea how we're able to work this out. Now, the uh, in examining this, we then were able to, to look at their performance index and then connect that to the actual business model, what we call a business model pattern, which is basically the strategy they adopt and be able to map that out. Again, beyond the scope of tonight, but certainly uh, this will, uh, if you want to look at the study, will give you a good idea of what they actually do. Do they have a green supply chain, for example? Uh, do they have better uh, uh, work practices or better training? Um, or, you know, what are they, act, are they actually doing to be more sustainable? And indeed, more importantly, what are they not doing so well that they can actually improve to become more sustainable? So this is illuminated by the machine learning and the predictive analytics going to work on the corporate information of these organizations. So this example is to do with companies, but we do the similar thing at the level of, say, governments, uh, such as countries. You can do it for bioregions. And you need, indeed, you can do it for the whole world. So when we look at the carbon cycle, we definitely look at worldwide. Um, I'll skip this slide, not so, so relevant, but it gives you an idea of uh, some of the things that we've been doing here. And I've kind of got to the end here. Um, so if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Uh, that's from the Dalai Lama. Uh, the reason we point this out is because uh, a lot of people think, you know, just little me, what could I do in this world that could make a difference? Well, guess what? You can. And we've demonstrated that through Thrive, where other individuals are working with us, uh, collaborating with us, and we're able to make significant changes in this world for the better in our own way, in our own area, and working with the uh, two and a half thousand other people, it's a little bit less than two and a half thousand other organizations, I should say, we're able to make the world a better place.